Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Portage First United Methodist Church. And to all of you out there watching from your homes, we wish you God's blessing this day. Welcome home, everybody. Yes, it's definitely good to be in God's house again. What's new? Uh, a few announcements before we begin. There they are. Um, we are, our gold can offering today is for our scholarship fund. Um, just so you know, since we haven't been meeting, our, our scholarship fund is, is in desperate need of help. So we're actually running two uh, different fundraisers. Uh, next Sunday, you can come pick up a to-go box filled with corned beef and cabbage dinner, uh, supplied for you by the one, lovely Lisa Hoover, um, Queen Bee herself. And uh, we're also doing a fun pasta fundraiser. And um, I have information for that that I meant to get out to you. Um, it should be in your bulletin. If not, I've got some extras I'll give to you after the service. Um, but it, you can purchase it online. It's delivered right to your home, and you guys can get some delicious pasta in fun shapes. Um, I personally got the pirate pasta for my sister, Kathy, who loves pirates. I got the music, the music notes pasta. Lots of fun stuff out there waiting for us. So um, with that in mind, we're also taking um, orders for Easter flowers. Hey, guys, we get to have Easter flowers this year. <laughs> um, <laughs> Easter flowers this year. All of our Bible studies and Sunday school classes are, are restarting um, with the exception of our children's classes. We're still going to continue to do those online. Our children's Sunday school classrooms are so small that I'm afraid we just can't um, accommodate social distancing in those spaces, and we definitely want to keep our children safe. So we're gonna, those are going to continue to sleep for just a little bit longer. Super seniors are coming back together, and next Sunday, y'all, next Sunday is daylight savings time. So make sure you set that clock forward. Spring forward, fall back. That's right. Set that clock forward because reasons. Let's face it, just because just they tell us to. That's why we'll do it. Doesn't change anything. Doesn't make anything better. We'll just do it because they tell us to. And uh, so just remember, uh, it, but if you come to church early, you can help me fold bulletins. It'll be fine. With these things in mind, I also wanted to talk to you about all of the renovations that you're seeing. Um, while you've been away these last few months, the, our board of trustees, our board of trustee presidents, have worked very hard to update and increase, increase the capacity of our church building. Um, let's start with the kitchen. Before her term as trustee president ended December 2020, Connie Elfson embarked on one of the most difficult and long-sought remodeling projects here at Portage First. Over her term as trustee president, she has repainted rooms, replaced carpets, repaired, restored, rewired, re-roofed, redesigned, and still has dreams she wants to accomplish. This is not, there is not a single inch of this building that has not been richly blessed by Connie's ministry among us. Now, through sound management and your generous donations, Connie has remodeled the church kitchen from ceiling to floor. The lighting in the kitchen has been changed, the ceiling repainted, the cabinets repainted and restored, the counters replaced, the coffee machine replaced, a new commercial grade non-slip flooring has been laid down, the walls were repainted, tile black sp backsplashes were added, and an obsolete and unused stove top were removed, increasing our counter space. The stove was replaced along with two new convection ovens, and it was a monster of a project, and there are, there are few who could have accomplished it as well as Connie. In order to get the job done, she relied on some wonderful volunteers. So many, in fact, I cannot name them all, so please forgive me as I'm confident I, oh, I missed someone. Special thanks to Kathy Wilson and her son ben, ben for the tile work in installing the floor, Virginia Phillips for her work painting and organizing, Ron Cutler and his sons who lifted those huge ovens and putting them in place and attached wheels to the bottom so that they can be moved to clean out underneath them. Jim Jordan, who cleaned the kitchen. Connie led a veritable army of volunteers who transformed the kitchen into a workable and completely modernized commercial kitchen. A kitchen that, despite all the renovation work, has continued to feed our community every Wednesday throughout the pandemic. Well done to all of you. In January 2021, our new trustee president, Stephen Schultz, in coordination with the church and council, embarked on a renovation of the church sanctuary to extend the dais, create more manageable stairs, kneelers that can be e easily stored when not in use, and create a more beautiful and modern look. The new paneling is, re is a repeated cross pattern referred to as board and batten, painted in a distant gray. The customized blue uh, that you see on the walls looks, uh, is special in that it looks like the night sky when, during candlelight services, and the bastion of interior design these days, of course, we also have shiplap down there. The new space um, is not only intended to be modern and beautiful, but dynamic and versatile as well. 
Instruments can be moved from place to place with ease, and we can add and take away st staging space as needed. In fact, the new design has given us 33% more space on the dais without taking away any congregational space at all. Our seating capacity remains unchanged. And to show us some of the amazing features, I invite uh, President um, Stephen Schultz to come down and show us the truly awesome stuff that you've done. These stairs were designed by Scott Falk according to state guidelines. And want we'll to show them the kneelers? The stairs were designed by Scott Falk according to state guidelines. He's one of many volunteers who helped pull off the renovation in such a short amount of time. It took round about 10 days. Special thanks to the Brown family, Cole Lawrence, Virginia Phillips, Kevin Kramer, who's right over there, uh, Joe Reynolds, our contractor, Jim Boonder, his assistant Marty, and Stephen's dad, Pete Schultz. We also wish to thank our resident artist, Jenny Brown and Heather Schultz for the design. Let us not forget the children who literally stained the front pieces of the stage. That's right, even our children assisted in building the house of the Lord. The central area of our church where the altar and the cross sit are the next on the list for renovation. Please note that the center wall on which the cross rests and is hung is just temporary. That's kind of why it looks so shaggy. Um, it's, no, it's not done. The trustee committee will be presenting new design ideas at an upcoming uh, church council meeting. We've also learned that over the last few months, uh, we need to upgrade our sound system as a means of improving the musical quality of our live streams. In conversations with the firm that maintains our church organ, we were informed that such an upgrade, with, su with such an upgrade, we could easily make it possible for the organ console to be placed on either side of the stage, improve the sound quality of our congregational singing, and present a more balanced professional broadcast each Sunday. Special thanks to the work of Connie Ellison and Stephen Schultz, our church's poised for a new age of ministry in our modern world. May God bless both of you, all your volunteers, for indeed you have blessed our church. And that's just the beginning, y'all. Why don't we uh, turn it over to our worship team and uh, begin our singing of praise to God today. Please rise if you're able.
runs up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. It's been a few months since Janice has been with us, um, but it's been COVID, so we haven't been able to properly anoint her until, we, until this morning and to welcome her as our accompanist. Um, just so you know, Janice is a, she comes to us from the Lutheran Church, so of course with our Methodist hymnal on the altar today, we placed a Lutheran hymnal to honor her, her past. She was telling me that the Lutherans don't have a trinity, they have a quadrilateral, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Johann Sebastian Bach. So. And uh, she also comes to us with a master's degree from Concordia University in church music, and she is a, a master organist as well. Um, she has gifts both in, in traditional music and contemporary music. And you know what, y'all? If you, you want to work with her, because she's a lot of fun. So if any of you have any musical gifts that you'd like to share here in our second service, you need to talk to Janice, because she is a lot, she's, she's a lot of fun. I call her my Greek woman with Hungarian tendencies, because she's both. <laughs> So having blessed her at our first service, um, let us offer her a blessing now. Dearly beloved, today at long last, we, we celebrate and welcome Janice Grafakis to ministry of music in our church. Janice, in serving as our accompanist and worship leader, we believe that you are called by God to direct, to sing, and to play instruments to the glory of Jesus Christ. 
We invite you to accompany the people of God and to worship among them. These are the ministries of Christ among us. Dear brothers and sisters, Janice is called to this ministry and needs your loyal support and prayers. O oh Lord, our God, bless these ministries of music and our new accompanist, Janice, and those who offer their musical gifts in your service. Give to all our musicians and directors love for you and for your people, fullness of heart as they praise you, and diligence that their music may be a worthy offering to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Will you join with me in our, our family prayer, the prayer Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I know that today's, today's scripture text is long. But you tell me, how do you edit the Ten Commandments? So with this in mind, why don't we join with me in Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation and of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commands. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to your Lord God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, your ser livestock or alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that, the, that your Lord God, that your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And when the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has only come to test you and to put the fear of him into you that you do not sin. And then the people stood at a di distance while Moses drew near to the, dark, to the thick darkness where God was. Here ends the reading. This time I invite Josh to come forward with our missions moment. Hello. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so I have a message about the scholarship fund, courtesy of Wendy. Each year, we as a church love to celebrate the success of our many graduates. In fact, we have a scholarship fund, and on the fourth Sunday of each month, the money collected in the gold can goes towards that scholarship fund. Well, as you might imagine, since we haven't worshipped in person so seldom, we haven't collected much in the gold cans. And now that spring has arrived, graduation is right around the corner. But never fear, we thought we'd use a little luck of the Irish to help raise funds for this year's graduation fund. Next Sunday, from 10 a.m. to 12.30, after both services, you can come into the fellowship hall and pick up corned beef and cabbage meals to go. There will be an opportunity to make a free will offering, and all proceeds from this tasty St. Patrick's Day meal will go to support the scholarship fund. 
Now, we can't guarantee that you'll find leprechauns or a pot of gold when you arrive, but we're pretty confident that you'll see some happy cooks dancing around a pot of yummy corned beef in the kitchen. Hope to see you there, and remember, we'll be social distancing and it's carry out only. We are also selling Fun Pasta to support the Educational Scholarship Fund. Fun Pasta comes in a lot of different fun shapes, from dinosaurs to paw prints, from sports teams to holiday shapes. You can have fun, eat pasta, and support the scholarship fund. There are flyers and an order form at the Connection Center, and you can order from a link on the church's February 25th Facebook post. A portion of these proceeds will go to the scholarship fund. Thanks so much, church, and remember, together we can make a difference. Our next scripture comes from St. John's Gospel, chapter 2. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those that were selling the doves, he said, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, The temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in th six days, in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken when he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival. Many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. So um, all of you know that I've been going to the uh, Chesterton Fit Body Boot Camp regularly now. Some mean people made me go. <laughs> Over there. Honestly, the only word in that sentence that I like is Chesterton. <laughs> Boot camp, no. <laughs> and I, you know, I go, and, and it's interesting because it's it start. It's not as terrible as it was in the beginning. In the beginning, I was pretty sure that they hated me because I love pizza too much. <laughs> and as I go, um, all the coaches are there. Uh, they're very supportive and very kind, and they all know their stuff. Like they know how to tell you what to do. They know the method backwards and forwards. They're all very poised. They're all very professional and funny too. And and they do a great job. Um, but there's also a, a marked difference between um, the coach, between most of the coaches and the, the guy who owns the business, Coach Ian. And he's a wonderful guy, a really, really great guy. But it's interesting because when, when, he, when he's coaching, he'll say more about what's going on. And it, it really hit me one day when I was doing something. I don't even remember what it was. I just remember, you know, 30 minutes of pain every day. That's pretty much all I remember. <laughs> just all a blur. But I was doing something, and my lower back was just in pain. Just, I was, it was terrible. I was just like, I'm, something's not working here. And he, he all of a sudden kind of stops, and he says, and by the way, guys, when you're doing this motion, um, what happens is that the muscles that we're trying to work get tired. So your lower back muscles step in to try and compensate. He said, and that's why you'll have lower back pain if you don't hold yourself the way you're, the way you're supposed to. So make sure you're not on your toes, you're on, your, you're on the heels of your feet. And you know, as soon as I corrected that, the, the back pain just, just diminished. And, and, I, and I, I knew that something had changed. And what struck me about that moment is that while all the other coaches know what they're doing, right? And they can tell you the method and they can tell you what to do. Ian has it like on a deeper level. Like he, he not only knows what to do or the process or the practice, he knows it on a deeper, more fundamental level. Now the word practice is one we use a lot and it's, it's but the context in which I wanna use it today, I want you to think about like a doctor's practice, right? Your doctor is a practitioner of a certain art. That means he does a series, of, a series of things in a certain order that's done in a right way. And we use the term practice to, to practice something, to get used to something, to, to prepare for something. Um, that's connected. The idea of practice is that you're doing something in the right way, in the right formula, over and over again until you get it, right? And anyone can be taught to practice, right? You can be taught, first you do this, and then you do this, and you follow the, the levels. But there's a step that goes beyond that, and that's referred to as praxis. 
you see the big fancy word on the screen behind you, praxis. Now in seminary, they actually teach you this. They teach you method and praxis, and you have method and praxis examinations. And when I, when I was ordained, I had to write about, about 60 pages on method and praxis. And, the, and what they're saying is, or what they're talking about with that is, that, um, th that they can tell me a bunch of information, and I can regurgitate that information onto the test and even get a good grade, right? I can tell you about the Jesuitical heresies of the 1620s, or I can tell you about, you know, why, uh, about Tertullian and all these famous, you know, religious leaders. But what I need to do is I need to get it one step further than that. I need to be like Ian. I need to get it where it's not just what I'm doing, but why I'm doing. The deeper sense of what's happening there, to know what's really going on it, when we talk about these things. And you know what's funny about the church is that we're great at praxis, at, at, at practice. We are so good at teaching you how to do stuff, right? Like, we can teach you to walk up to communion using your both of your hands, and we can teach you to, to pray. Remember the five-finger prayer, right? We got the thumb, which is the worker, right? So we pray for our work. And we got the pointer finger, so that reminds us to pray for others, right? They got the finger that sticks up higher than the rest, so we pray for our leaders, because leaders are always higher than the rest. And then we got the people who are closest to us, the family, right? Because this is us over here. So we got the family, we pray for our family, and then finally, we pray for ourselves. And we always remember to pray for others before ourselves. That's, that's why it's the smallest finger, right? We do that? Do we teach that to our children? We teach them little acronyms like ACTS, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication, right? We teach them how to pray these things. And let's just, look, let's just try something. Our Father who art in heaven. See, you got it, right? You've practiced. You're here, in fact. And coming here is also a practice. We come here, we do these things, we go through certain ritual actions over and over again, right? And the reality is, is that all of that is good. Lent is actually a season where we practice, that we call them spiritual disciplines, where we pray more, and we, and we offer ourselves to God, and where we do charitable acts, and, and all of that is good, but it's good because it's trying to get us somewhere. It's trying to lead us from a place of practice to a place of praxis, a place where it's out there somewhere, and we're doing it to where it's in your soul, and it changes who you are. The reality of today's text is that one of the texts appointed for today is the, is the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know about you, but when I went to vacation Bible school in the 80s, I had to, I had to memorize the, the, the vacation Bible school, and in return, they gave me chocolate. Yeah, that's why I go to the church to fit my boot camp today. <laughs> it's all church. <laughs> y'all, yeah, I'm blaming you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so I had to learn it, right? And, and then you came in, and you, 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 you had to say them to the teacher, and if you missed one, she would she help you out, you know? And then you get a star on the little chart, and I learned it, right? And we love the Ten Commandments, don't we? We want, we, want, we want monuments to it outside our courthouses, great big Ten Commandments there. We want to put them up on the wall in our children's classrooms. We, we insist on this, right? And we even, we even go to our state legislators to make sure that this happens, right? The funny thing about it, though, is if you hadn't said it, if I hadn't read it to you today, if you had just walked in off the street, if you didn't have your bulletin in front of you, if, and I asked you where are the Ten Commandments in the Bible, you know, how many of you really would have known it, right? I know you wouldn't have been able to just look at her. <laughs> How many of you really would have been able to say, oh, that's in Exodus chapter 20? And I know that that's true because when I got to seminary, we had to take what was called a Bible competency exam. And though I could recite the Ten Commandments, I had no idea where they were. And that's the reality of most people, right? Even though we insist our culture learn them, we haven't really learned them ourselves. They haven't made it into us, right? And the Ten Commandments actually have a movement to them. They start with God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship idols. You shall not take the name of your Lord in vain. And then it moves to sort of the relationships we have with each other. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. It starts moving into the community sense, right? And then it gets all the way down to the end, and it's, it starts talking about what's going on inside your very heart. Do not covet what your neighbor has. So the movement of the Ten Commandments is that it starts all the way up there with God, and then it gets right there to what's happening in your very own heart. It moves from practice, what are you doing, to what's going on in here. And that is what we're hoping that we are doing when we come to worship and when we pray. We're hoping that what's sitting out there somewhere is going to come into our hearts. Lent is a time for extra prayer, right? We spend more time in prayer. We do the practice of prayer. 
But have we often told you, brothers and sisters, have we shared with you what is actually happening when you pray? You see, what you may not be aware of is that all around you is an invisible world of angels and demons and spiritual things that are happening at all times in all places. And there's constantly all around us battle and activity going on that we do not see. But you've probably felt it before. Have you ever walked into a room and, the, and, the, and the, you're like, ooh, something's uh, tense in here. What's no one's even said anything. No one's even looked up, but you feel it, don't you? There's just a feeling. I remember when we were with my nanny and my papa, and we went to a little cafe alongside the road in West Virginia, and we walked in the room, and we felt it. I just know what every, I, I, I knew exactly what they were thinking as soon as they walked in. Yankees. <laughs> That's literally what I just, there was just this feeling of, oh yeah, they're not from around here. And then Nanny and Peppa walked in and it was fine because they're true West Virginians, right? But there's just this feeling, you know that that's happening. And that sort of spiritual sense, when you pray, you are speaking to that invisible world. And you are literally pulling the presence of God into the middle of it. When you pray, you are actually speaking to the spiritual powers around you, the same way that God spoke into the darkness and brought forth light at the beginning of creation. When you pray, you become a light bringer into the universe. And the same power with, 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 with which God brought forth the universe is what you're bringing into the spiritual world around you. That's what happens when the practice of prayer starts to move into you and it becomes praxis. The funny thing about all of this is that we see it in the story of Jesus, and we see how much Jesus wants this for his people because of how he reacted to what was going on in the temple that day. Jesus arrives in the temple, and it's become something, and it's not what he wanted, right? He arrives in the temple, and he finds that there in what's referred to as the court of the nations, he finds that they've they turned it basically into a marketplace. Now, here's the funny thing about the temple in Jerusalem in the first century, century. It was sort of like the further into the temple you would get, right, the more elite it became. So this section right here, let's just pretend that our church is the ancient temple. We're just going to pretend for a moment that we're here. Now, if we were in that place, right now the place where I am standing would be called the Holy of Holies. And this, rather than an altar, would be the Ark of the Covenant. Y'all, y'all seen Indiana Jones, right? You remember Indiana Jones? You remember that, right? That's what this is. And only I, as the high priest, can be up here. And, on, and even then, only once a year. Like, there's a whole situation that has to happen. Out there, let's just pretend that there's a big curtain here, and out there is a place called, um, called the Holy Place. And the Holy Place is only for priests— so you all are the priests now, and, uh, and only, at, sir, only when they're doing their duties. So perhaps you're presenting incense, perhaps you're, but only, you're only allowed in this space at a certain time. Then if we go outside of our door, maybe into the narthex area, into the, into the fellowship hall, that would be what's called the court of the priests. So you all could go in there too, because obviously you're here, so you must be priests. But beyond that, normal people who are not priests or Levites, are not allowed into the court of priests. So let's put them, let's put everybody else on the portico, at least the males. Because outside the court of priests is another court called the court of the, of the sons of Israel. So in order to be that, you gotta be a son. So sorry, ladies. And by the way, most of you wouldn't be allowed in here either. <laughs> and so, uh, Right out there, perhaps on a little portico right outside my office, that's where the, where the sons of Israel are gathering. And you go a little bit further, maybe perhaps out in the parking lot, that would be the court of the daughters of Israel. So in order to get here, you would have had to have walked through several different places, that w and, and it gets more and more elite the further in you go. And then let's say, over there at the farm is what we call the court of the nations. And that's where God-fearers can go. These are people who are not Hebrew, not Jewish in their, in, their her, in their physical heritage, in their biological heritage, but they've come to know Abraham's God. They've come to, to be a believer in the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jacob. So they are converts to the faith, and they're Gentiles, they're of the nations. But they can come because they're believers, because they've had what's referred to as a mitvah or a spiritual bath, they are allowed to go into the court of the nations. 
And it is here in the court of the nations that the priests have set up their market. And boy, howdy, are they doing an amazing job, all right? Because guess what they can do there? Well, you can't just bring any lamb for a sacrifice here at the temple. You have to bring us, a, a, we'll, we'll have to certify that these lambs are, meet our standards. So we'll sell you the right kind of lamb. It'll be a temple certified lamb, so you're just gonna need to pay for it. But, but you know what? You can't, we can't use your American money for that. You need to have your money changed over into the temple currency. So we've got some money changers out there. This is like, um, this is like when you go to, that, uh, to Chuck E. Cheese or you go to um, um, Dave and Buster's when you take your hard-earned money and you turn it into tokens or you put it on a little card. That's what's going on here. Two of your American dollars equals one temple currency, right? And then you use that temple currency to buy the lamb, right? Think about that. All the money is going into the priest's coffers, right? And so it's become this, this amazing money-making market for them, and they know, they, they knew what they were doing. And so that is what's become of this outer court, the court of nations. And I want you to imagine what this is like for you. Let's say that you are all converts to the face, and there you are out there, and you're trying to pray. You're trying to practice so that the love of God will become a part of you. You're trying to do that. So while you're praying, there are sheep and goats and people selling and people bartering and people bargaining and, and, the, 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 and the noise. And as you're, trying to, as you're trying to pray and connect with God, there's all this stuff going on around you. And all so that the priests could make more money. And now you see why Jesus is angry. Now you see why Jesus takes up the, the whip and says, no, you're, th this is supposed to be a place of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of robbers. You're stealing every cent from these people. First, you take more than you should in the, in the, the money-changing process, and then the, they, they have to take the money that they just changed to buy a sheep from you because you can only use the temple-certified sheep. And then, then once they do that, you, know, you take that sheep, and they never see it again, and you can just walk it right back around the building and sell it again. Because these are the court of nations people, right? They're not going to be able to get close enough to see you actually place that lamb on the altar. Jesus knew exactly what was going on, and he was not happy. And why? Because by forbidding the people their practice, they would never get to praxis. It would never get inside them. It would never become a part of who they are. You know, all of those coaches that I mentioned earlier, and I said that, that Ian was the best because it's sort of a part of who he is, all of them are in the process of becoming just like him, a bit of, of, of having that be in their hearts, you know, in, in, into, into who they are. That's part of what, as they become more and more professional, and they're already pretty, pretty amazing, as they become that way, it's going to become a part of who they are. It matters to Ian. He's the owner of the place. He wants to do the best work. It's become a part of who he is. And you, in your praying, in your fasting, in, in, in your practice, it becomes a part of who you are and begins to transform the world around you. Now, the best example I can give of this is one that sets my teeth, as my nanny would say, one that sets my teeth on edge, one that makes me angry to talk about. So just, just walk with me. We'll be angry together. Um, one of my pre preaching professors, Joy Moore, tells the story of how she was working one of those large downtown churches, and she was an associate pastor there. And um, the, the senior pastor was incredibly accomplished, probably had some letters after his name and doctor in front of his name and a few other things. And she said, here she is, she's working in her office, and uh, all of a sudden, four young men come into her office carrying a fifth young man, He's not walking, they're carrying him. And they set him down in a chair in front of him. And, um, and they said, well, we'll talk to you later, man. And they walked right back out. And she said, and she, she kind of looks at him and she said, she asked the stupidest question she's ever asked her in her life. She goes, so what brings you in here today? And he goes, my friends. <laughs> it was, she was like, duh. <laughs> she goes, what I mean is, what do you need? Like, what's, what's going on? And he said, well... My friends are, are worried about me because they know if I'm not here, I'm going to be drinking the whole day and that I've been making myself sick and um, that they, they don't want me to get, they, they want me safe. And so they brought me here. And he, she, so, so they start to talk. And the senior pastor walks in. He says, Joy, I, I need to talk to you. And she said, well, sir, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of something. I'll, I'll be with you in a minute or two. Um, and he goes, no, Joy, I need to talk to you now. So she's wondering, is there a gun? Is there, you know, like, 
clearly he can see I'm counseling someone, like, what's going on? Is there some sort of danger that I'm not aware of? You know, are the police outside ready to arrest this young man? Like, what's going on? So she walks out with him, and he sa she says, what can I do for you, sir? And he said, <sighs> he said, <"Urgh." laughs> he said, that young man's parents do not give enough money to this church to make him worthy of your time. <sighs> I know. And she, you know, I know Joy. She's amazing. And, and she, she just didn't say anything at first. And she, she, I could see it. I can so see, I could see, I could see the, the, the way her shoulders hang. I can see it. I can see the whole thing. And she said she just kind of walked away. And then she walked back. And then she walked away again. I could see it. And then she walked back. And she said, my God died for that young man, and he is worth every second of my time. And then she walked right back, at, back into her office and, and counseled that young man. But you know what I thought about that, what I think about that and what, where this connects with us is, I bet that pastor, that senior pastor guy, I bet he could say prayers that would bring, bring you to tears. I bet he could preach sermons that would convict you and raise you up at the same time. I bet he was inspiring and amazing. He was, after all, the pastor of a large, tall, steeple church. I bet you he could do things with a church budget that would make, make our own finance chairperson, Andrew Brown, weep with joy. I bet you he could do amazing, amazing things. But you know what? It wasn't in him, was it? All that practice hadn't gotten into his heart to become praxis the business of who we are, not just doing something repeatedly, but doing it because it's a part of you. It takes a lot of repetition to get it there, you know? It takes a lot of work. Um, not, not to, this is not a gaining your salvation kind of thing. It takes a lot of work for, for the scriptures to move into who you are. It takes a lot for that, that practice to become a part of who you are. And as I told them in the first service, I, even as I'm preaching this, even as I'm saying these words to you, you know what I just keep thinking? If I had a mirror right now, I'd be like, gosh, I wish I had more praxis. I wish it was in me more. I wish, like, I wish it were a bigger part of me than it is. I could do so much better. And so I guess, for me and for you, practice makes praxis, and praxis makes perfecter. The time has come for the giving of our tithes and offerings. Jesus, our Lord, is uh, teaching us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, we invite you to remain seated um, and pr present your offering at the end of the service. For now, just offer your heart and your soul to God, that God may do good work in your heart.
On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread, gave thanks, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to the Father and from the vine from which it came, and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, O Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving for all that Christ has done for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one in ministry to all the world until, we, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Our elements today are all uh, gluten-free. Um, I'm going to hand these out, and we'll all partake together, so just hold on to them until instructed to, cha- to do so.
My brother Steve back there mentions that he took communion in the first service, as did I. And you're right, Steve. Um, there's just, um, and sometimes at Asbury as a chapel assistant, I'd take communion like three times a day because I had to be there for every chapel service. And uh, the reason that I, I, I laugh is because I had the same feeling. And I read, when I was in seminary, I, I had to read John Wesley's treatise on communion. And he, it was beautiful. I mean, it was one of those beautiful pieces of, of literature I've ever read. And by the end of it, I'm in my church dorm room, ugly crying, like, ah, it's so beautiful. And um, in it, he talks about the duty of constant communion. That if this represents the presence of Christ in our lives, do we not want to feast on it as often as we possibly can? Now, I was so moved by John Wesley's words that I was telling everyone about it, and about a week later, they wanted us to go back further in church history and read Augustine's, uh, St. Augustine, who was about 300 years or 400 years before John Wesley, and they wanted us to read his treatise on communion. And that's when I figured out how much John Wesley had stolen <laughs> from Augustine. Um, if you'll take the bottom of your cup, and there's a, a communion wafer in the bottom. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Take and feed on him in your hearts by faith. You can open the top now. This is the blood of Christ, which is shed for you and poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, in these days of COVID, this is not the way we want to take communion. The Lord doesn't taste the way we want it to taste, and it's not the experience that we want to have. But it nourishes our bodies, and it nourishes our souls. And so we thank you for the feast that we have, the feast of your presence in our life, the, the fact that you are here beneath the surface of the bread and the wine. Gracious one, we truly thank you for all that you've done in our midst and all you continue to do from heaven. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our closing song. 